Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. We're going to get started. I know we've got some people joining us uh, on Zoom as well. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping at the front. Uh, if you are on Zoom, at the end, we're going to be taking, you know, obviously, questions from everybody in the audience, including the virtual audience. So at the end of the program, if you do have a question, just hit the raise hand button in the bottom of your Zoom call, and we'll give you permission to, to speak at that time. So I'm Seth Wallach. I'm the Water Authority's Community Outreach Coordinator. And I want to tell you a little bit about why we do this program really quick. Um, there's a lot of information. Water is constantly in the news. We know that. And so we want to make sure everybody's getting the same information and everybody's getting accurate information about their water, more importantly. That's why we started this a few years ago. And we hold a water talk every two months in a new community. Uh, we serve the entire county from Melville to Montauk with some gaps that are some other smaller water districts. Um, but our service territory does span the length of the county. And today you're going to hear from um, the two on staff experts I've brought with me. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves at the appropriate time. Um, but they're going to tell you um, a little bit about how to protect your water supply and a little bit about your drinking water quality and where your water comes from. Um, Tim here is actually also going to provide some uh, some updates about some local infrastructure projects we've been doing in this area. And I'm going to tell you about a program uh, called Water Track that actually lets you monitor the quality of uh, raw water from home. We'll tell you how to find all of your um, water quality data in terms of treated SCWA water and also how to find data about raw water quality before it goes through treatment through Water Track. And like I said, most importantly, we're just here to answer everybody's questions because we know um, everybody always has questions about water and rightfully so. So a little bit about um, who we are, what us CWA is. Um, we're an independent public benefit corporation operating under the public authorities law. We serve about 1.2 million people countywide. We began our operations in 1951. Uh, and what being an independent public benefit corporation means is that uh, we actually operate on a not-for-profit basis. People don't often realize that. There are a lot of uh, for-profit water companies on Long Island. Uh, we are not one of them. We're also one of the largest groundwater suppliers in the entire country, especially of sole groundwater. So who aren't we? Um, we're not a branch of Suffolk County government, despite the name. A lot of people don't realize that. They'll call the county when there's a problem with their water. Uh, and we don't create or enforce drinking water regulations. That's the responsibility of the EPA and the New York State Department of Health to create and enforce those regs. Uh, John Marafino uh, actually couldn't be with us tonight. He had a family emergency at the last second. So I'm going to go ahead and play John for a second. Uh, John's our customer growth coordinator. And he was just going to kind of outline the benefits uh, of um, public water if you are uh, still on a, a private well. Uh, so obviously, Suffolk County Water Authority water, as Kevin will tell you later, uh, it's tested constantly, even when the lab isn't staffed at night or on the weekend, the instrumentation is always running. Uh, and so uh, you're not getting obviously that same testing with a private well, we recommend that you do test yearly through the County Department of Health if you do have a private well. Um, but it's just you never know how often it's really going to be tested. And then compounds that our laboratory finds in the water, you don't have the benefit of that uh, testing either. Changing filters can be annoying. And as we'll get into a little bit later, our lab tests for 414 compounds um, that you, you're just not going to get um, with a private well. Our water is uh, relatively inexpensive. It's $2.20 for every 1,000 gallons, or 0 0.002 per gallon. Um, it's not tied to the electric grid. So even when you lose power, like in a hurricane or, or other um, natural disaster like that, um, even just that the power goes out, you'll never lose your water service. And obviously if our infrastructure in the street, our water main is damaged, it's no cost to you. We're going in and fixing our infrastructure, of course. Private wells, if you do have to redrill uh, or make repairs, they can be very expensive. Something, an expense you wouldn't have to worry about with the water authority. Um, obviously, your electric bill would go down if you no longer need electricity to run your well, although you would be paying a water bill, of course, it's a trade off. And it's actually never been more affordable to connect because the Water Authority for the first time uh, now offers financing over 25 years to connect.
So it would be $5,000 down. You have up to 25 years. Uh, interest late, rates are between three and 4%, depending on how, uh, how long uh, the payment plan is with payments due uh, once a quarter. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin, who's gonna tell you about uh, your local water quality in this area. So thank you very much for coming out tonight. And I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about water quality in our lab. My name is Kevin Dirk. I'm the Director of Water Quality and Laboratory Services. So SCWA is Water Quality Testing Laboratory. We have a state-of-the-art groundwater testing laboratory. It's the largest groundwater testing laboratory in the country. The lab is in Hopog. It's a little bit over 26,000 square feet. We have a staff of 54 uh, members who are doing testing. It's chemists, microbiologists, technicians, and a support staff. We test samples are taken at the wellhead at various stages of treatment and within a distribution system for bacteria and a wide range of inorganic and organic contaminants. We analyze the water as it comes right out of the ground. And if we have treatment in place, such as a granular activated carbon or an iron removal system in some areas, we test it when it goes into the uh, treatment system and when it comes out and when it goes into the distribution system. This way we can make sure that the treatment is actually doing its job. We analyze for a little, well, we, we analyzed 91,000 samples last year for 191,000 uh, test results. And we test for 414 compounds. That's 265 more than required by our regulators. We wanna be proactive rather than reactive. And part of that is like, we participate in what's called the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. It's a rule that comes out by the EPA every five years where they, they want us to test for 28 to 30 compounds. They'll look at the occurrence data across the nation and then it'll determine whether to regulate it. So we started this in 2000. That's when the UCMR first started, 2001, I believe it was. And we've done all five rounds. We're gonna be, this is the fifth round starts next year. We've been doing all the testing in-house. Now there's not many labs that do that across the whole nation There's only 24 and most of them are private. There's only three utilities that have their own lab that do this testing. So we're in an elite group. Um, and we also test at a higher frequency that's from, than required from uh, Suffolk County Department of Health Services. Some of their requirements for inorganic testing is maybe once a year per well. We do it at least twice. If we have treatment in place, we probably do it monthly. We want to keep track of uh, how the treatment is working. So we have to adjust any parameters. We can do that immediately. And our SCWA's in-house standards for water quality are often tougher than state or federal regulations. Um, there's a thing called a maximum contaminant level. And what that, it's an MCL. And what that means is I can serve you water with a volatile organic and it, up to most of them are set at five parts per billion. So if I exceed the five parts per, per billion, I could be, have a violation. But in the, at the water authority, we start preparing for treatment before it hits two and a half parts. So when it's two and a half parts, we wanna put treatment in place. When we do put treatment in place for like a volatile organic, it's granular activated carbon. As I said before, we we test the water when it goes into the filter and when it comes out. When it starts coming out and it reaches half the MCL, we change the carbon. That may, that's more costly for us with carbon changes, but it provides a better quality product for our customers. So this, we're gonna talk a little bit about the levels of detection because it can be a little bit overwhelming. The state-of-the-art laboratory instruments can detect compounds in water down to parts per million, parts per billion, or even parts per trillion. When I first started there like 30 years ago, it was parts per million, but technology and methodology have made advances, so it's a lot easier. But to understand that, for reference, one part per million is one second in 12 days. One part per billion is one second in 32 years, and one part per trillion is one second in 32,000 years. Now we test for pharmaceuticals and some of the stuff we test for like acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. 
our detection level is 50 parts per trillion. And I know when people see that and they look at the report and they go, I don't want that in my water. But to put it in perspective, you'd have to drink two and a half million gallons of water to get the same dose as one uh, as a, of extra strength Tylenol. So it's very low levels, trace amounts. What we're looking at now is a sample station. One of our technicians is out in, uh, out in the field. We have 325 of these sample stations throughout our distribution system. And what she's doing, she's collecting a bacteriological sample. Every month we collect over 940 bacteriological samples throughout the distribution system. We check for pH, we check for chlorine. We wanna make sure there's no bacteria present because that can affect you right away. It can be acute reaction. So besides testing for bacteriology, we also uh, go out and collect chemical sets for inorganics and volatile organics too throughout the distribution twice a year. We wanna make sure there's nothing going on in the distribution system after it leaves our wells. And then the final thing I'm just gonna talk about is what we call the consumer confidence report or our annual water quality report. Um, if you go to our website, scwa.com, you click on uh, water quality reports, it'll bring you to a page where we have five years of supplemental data, which is the raw data before there's any treatment. We also have five years of the consumer confidence report or our annual water quality report. You can access the data, see what it is for your pressure zone. And it's very easy to get your data because you can either type on type in your address and it'll bring you to that pressure zone, or there's a map, an interactive map. You can click on house close to your proximity and it'll bring you to your data. And you can review the data. And if you have any questions, you can always give us a call at 631-218-1138. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Tim Kilcommons, our chief engineer. Thank you, Kevin. Good evening, everyone. As Kevin said, my name is Tim Kilcommons. I'm a licensed professional engineer, chief engineer. Of Suffolk County Water Authority. And I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about our water infrastructure. What is it that makes up uh, SCWA's water supply system? So a couple of quick statistics to get you started. We're a fairly large system, 633 total wells, 240 somewhat pump stations. At any given time, about 600 of those wells are active. We have 68 storage tanks um, that hold a total of about 71 and a half million gallons of storage. Average daily pumping of 210 million gallons, peak pumpage of 470 million gallons, and we have 37,000 fire hydrants in the system. Um, another stat that's not on here is we have about 6,000 miles of water main um, in our system as well. And this graph's just depicting just how vast we are. It's a, it's a shot of all the well fields and administrative facilities that the Water Authority has. So you could see we're everywhere from Amityville out to Montauk um, and Huntington, Cold Spring Harbor, all the way out to Orient on the North Fork. On the source water side, where does our water come from? I think by now customers are, are fairly well educated on the water cycle. Um, a couple of takeaways from this slide that I like to point out is, is one thing that not everybody realizes is about 50% of the water that falls as rain or precipitation um, ends up in, uh, in the aquifers, right? The other 50% is lost to surface runoff um, and evaporation. Uh, and then a larger issue that I'd like to point out is you can see on the slide um, where we have the two wells there in the lower right-hand side, a shallow well and a deeper well that we have depicted there. And what we're trying to show there is that you can actually see, and I'll, I'll forward to the next one here, that so for, for the deeper well, you have infiltration taking place on the farm field. And a lot of people wouldn't necessarily link that to a well that's fairly far away from it. But you can see just due to the hydrology uh, and the geology itself, and also for the pumping of the well, that those contaminants can actually be pulled in from far distances. And similarly, on the shallow well, you can see those homes there with the septic systems in front of them. 
that that shallow well would be susceptible to that kind of contamination. A shot just specific to local area wells, kind of difficult to see here because it's kind of a wide area, but in terms of actual in Bridgehampton area, Lumber Lane would be one of our main uh, pump stations. Scuttle Hole Road would be another one. Uh, wells here typically average about a thousand gallons a minute in capacity. And we, we talked a little bit about uh, storage tanks with the statistics. So we're actually building a tank right now, a two million gallon concrete tank out in uh, Town Line Road in Wainscott. Uh, the tank itself is, is substantially complete right now. It's not yet put into service. We still have some testing to do with it. Uh, but just to give you an idea of how, how big these things are, that diameter that you see there, that's the, the floor slab being poured. Uh, you can see the reinforcing steel in it and the pump truck about to start pouring concrete in it. And the diameter of that tank is about 130 feet. In terms of infrastructure, local infrastructure improvements that we've done in the spring, our construction maintenance department, which is responsible for the uh, installation and maintenance of our distribution system, the pipes in the ground, they did a 2,000 foot replacement um, for Champton Slayer Harbor Turnpike, and that was done in coordination with the uh, county drainage project. That does two things it helps minimize inconvenience to the public because we're all getting the work done at the same time. Um, it also comes down plus for the customers because we're having restoration that's being done by others. We gotta start using this, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I think so. And coming up this winter, uh, we'll be doing a 16 inch uh, water main Italian on Montauk Highway from Sagaponic. And this will actually help leverage um, our ability to move water away from that new tank that we're doing. Um, and right now we do have connectivity to the west from that tank, but it's it's much further south than Montauk Highway. So this is a much more direct way that will impact the uh, And with that, I'll turn it back over to Seth. Yeah, you can give go for it. That's fine. We usually do it after, but in the interest of time, that's fine. <laughs> So we have a network, a network of water mains, our distribution system, right? And those can range in size from anywhere from a, a small main might be four inch to the larger, larger mains that we have. We do have some larger than this, but mostly 16 would be a, a large size here. And so neighborhoods are gridded with those pipes. And the water will come up from the ground, go through the well go through uh, treatment, all of our wells, all of the well water that we pump receives at a minimum, it's going to get chlorine, um, it's going to get some type of pH bubble uh, to prevent corrosion, both in our pipes and in your copper piping at your house. Um, so it goes into those water mains in the streets. And then from, from there, there's what we call a tap that leads to usually a copper surface, sometimes plastic. And from that, that's how it gets into your Testing being done from that well after before treatment and after knowing the clean, that was the testing. Yeah, so there's, there's testing done, as Kevin said, there's testing done right at the head of the well. So as soon as it comes out of the ground, we're taking a snapshot, taking a look at what exactly is the water quality coming out of the ground. We're looking at it again after treatment to see what it is again. And then we're also taking a look at it in the distribution system to make sure that it's meeting standards. And then Kevin can give you an idea of the frequency. Uh, it, it will depend on the contaminants. But... Basically, if we have something like a bottle of gas, we're only required to give the water when it's positive. What we'll do is we'll do it monthly. And then if the level is elevated enough, we'll increase the monitoring. It could even be weekly, depending on what the level of contaminants. And that's how we do our scheduling based on the level. But the bare minimum is quarterly, right? Yeah, for yeah. bottle organics. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it sometimes brown? I have town water in Bridgehampton too. And sometimes the water is brown. Do you have that? Yeah, I mean, it, that's what I'm hearing. Serious. Okay. Well, Serious I mean, like brown, like yeah. muddy water. 
Well, I mean, usually the wells that feed this area have very low levels of volume. Yeah. So and the pipes. So sometimes you may get stuff that may settle out in, in the pipes. It could also be disturbance to the system. If somebody's uh, open up a fire hydrant, it stirs up with maybe in the bottom of the main. Or yeah. reverse, what we call reverse flows, where water typically flows one way in a water main. Um, but some demand in the system is causing it to run another way. It can stir up sediment. Um, it also would depend, you know, we, we could talk afterwards, but if it's generally hot water that you're seeing with that issue, it, it'll usually be a sign of an internal problem. Like that. It's, it's not hot water. water. It's cold. It's the cold water. And it's like after a rain, especially. It shouldn't have anything. No, it shouldn't. shouldn't. It does. I see it happen. And the filter on the kitchen sink I put in two weeks ago. It's bad. All right, but you both have all water. You both are customers. Yeah. Then what I would recommend is you call up uh, customer service and call them, and they'll schedule to have a sample collected. And okay. that's where we can resolve it. So what the issue is, if it's something that, like we said, maybe it's a disturbance in the system, it should subside. If it's something where maybe it's settled out. We would even see about flushing the system out. They do that occasionally. Yeah, we do that. Both our customer service departments and our construction maintenance department has a, a robust flushing program for the entire system. And customer service will respond to specific okay. complaints. I was, I was just, just going to say that. Yeah. And that spoke to customer service. I think it was like three, three, four. It was my plumber. He complained to my plumber. And he checked the hot water heater, yeah. put a hose on it. Take your contact information after okay. the talk, and I, I can, especially if you have an email, it would be great. It's the whole neighborhood. I'm on Butter Lane. Me too. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. All right. So that, <laughs> well, we're neighbors. Are you before the underpass? Before. Yes. Okay. We're neighbors. We're in the same block, I think. Yeah. And, and when I spoke to the person, he said, well, it's, it's hydrant flushing. I'm married to a retired fireman. I'm familiar with hydrant. And we did do one in this spring because we had a real bad round of it in yeah. the way. But um, um, it's a pipes. It's a and if and if it turns out that we have to flush the area more often, that's so, definitely We're something we can do. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. So the flushing program that Tim referenced earlier, a lot of the scheduling that they'll do, um, they don't hit the same communities every year. We vary it, you know, who, who we hit each year. But a lot of that scheduling is based around customer complaints of where we are hearing that we need it the most. Yeah. So if you if you let customer service know that they could flush that area more often if that's what it takes if the pipes are all that if it's necessary. Yeah. Really that's right. Pastor, you know, like, woman. No, well, no, no that, that shouldn't be. No, and that's part. We like also that. we personally replaced the pipe that went from the road to our house. Yeah, you want to about six years ago or something. With brand new copper pipe, so mm -hmm. it's not, I don't think, in our property. Okay, well, that's one of the reasons we do this program is we want to hear these things, we don't want anyone to feel like they're being you know brushed to the side. We want to know what's, what's really going on in the communities. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir, we had a question. Where are the uh, those two uh, on town line the town line road, pipe uh, right. Uh, right north of the airport, just north of the airport. So they draw on the water from the polluted water around the airport? No, those, those wells actually don't have any treatment on them now. Those wells so are, you are aware that the whole rain spot Yes, sir. We hooked up over 500 so homes as a result of, of that contamination. Our wells, okay. our, our, our wells are, are pristine. They're, they have no, none of them have any type of treatment except for the pH and the chlorine. Like Tim was saying, uh, we like we check them constantly. But I mean, if there was any trace of uh, contaminant in it, like a bowel organic or anything else, we would put it on a, a treatment. Um, I mean, as Tim showed with the 
the uh, where the water may be coming down or where you may have a bit of uh, contamination may not impact the wells. It may, you know, it may actually well, be the waste, I don't know where the waste got that was caused the problem. Now, where is one on say all the ground? But another another factor in that is the depth of the well. So we have, like for instance, Scuttle Hole Road. Our wells are over three hundred feet deep. There, you know, a residential well is not typically going to be residential. Probably exactly, and so that's where you're going to see most of your. That's. I'm sorry. Where is the one on set all the time? I have a map and I can show you after the meeting. I don't see it on here. I can't tell you what, what road is other than being on transfer Sandhawk station. Or I'm sorry? Is it near the transfer station or is it up in railroad tracks? I'll, I'll show it to you afterwards. I'm not, I'm not going to take a guess. I don't know where the transfer station is. So. You are aware there was a dump there at one time. Yes. And again, the well water quality is tested consistently. I mean, like Tim said, we, we test the water constantly. And besides that, our regulator, Suffolk County Department of Health Services, they test our sites too. They go out with our uh, production control operators and they collect samples from the wells. So they have a long standing history of our, uh, our wells and, and the contaminants that are present. And the, result, yeah, the results of those, I'm sorry, the results. There's mangoes now in the wells. And where is that coming from? Did we see it on those manganese in the second part? You'll see occasionally, you'll see, uh, I forget the exact well, but it's, it's like 0 0.05, 0 0.06. So it, it's, but it fluctuates, it's not constant. Yeah. And that's still kind of low. I mean, the, the MCL is 0.3. So we're talking about a quarter of the MCL. For, uh, Where is it coming from? Well, it's naturally occurring manganese. It's naturally occurring. Is that what to do with the winery? No, no, it shouldn't be affected by the winery. It's just naturally occurring in, in the soil, in the, in the layers of the aquifer. Anybody else? Yeah. So the water that doesn't get to you, is it consumed? Where does that end up? Does it recycle? I missed the first part does of the question. The water, water comes and goes. So it's not all used or consumed. Mm -hmm. To go back into the aquifer, does it go back into reuse in some form? Or is it just so it, yeah, it all depends how, how people use it. So in, in essence, water that's used for lawn watering is going right down back in the aquifer in, in, in theory, yeah. Yeah, if you're talking you're talking about water that's been pumped out of the aquifer. Yes. Yeah. Come through your house, you use some cut off. Right. And just go back in for reuse. Yeah, so that's exactly what Seth just said. For water that remains in the aquifer, that doesn't stay there either. Right, so water in the aquifer is flowing within the aquifer, and then generally, if you drew like a spine down the center of the island, the east to west, the water would be flowing towards the sound on one side and flowing towards the bay and the ocean on the other. Well, the last piece of our, our, our presentation, um, before I'm going to go turn it over to questions for those on, on the Zoom call as well. Um, I just want to talk about um, water track and water conservation really quickly. Um, so just so everybody knows how to use this tool called water track. Um, it's an online GIS based water quality database uh, that's brought to you by the Long Island Commission for Aquifer Protection. Uh, the Long Island Commission for Aquifer Protection uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a bi county commission. Um, so it's every water supplier in Suffolk County, including us, every water supplier in Nassau County sits on LICAP. Both county executives, both county health departments, um, every, every you know every stakeholder um, in, in, in government for both counties really has a seat at the table at LICAP. And the data is pulled from well, well data, but it's also pulled from laboratory data. And so, so for example, this customer was um, searching for a, they were curious about chloride specifically. So how water track works is, and if you can see, I know it's a little blurry, but in the top left, um, you can plug in your address and it'll actually zoom right to your neighborhood. And then if you want to search by anything specific, we search, for example, for chlorides, um, anything above uh, 250 milligrams per liter. And you can see there actually was a result over here. That's that other circle down to the right where we actually saw um, some high chlorides. 
Uh, water truck is also a great tool for us as a water supplier because we can do a little bit of detective work. Why do we have chlorides in that one pocket and, and, and nowhere else? You know, we, we discovered there was actually um, uh, a, a, one of the highway departments had, a, you know, the salt trucks. They had the mountain of salt, but it was completely uncovered. So when it would rain, that salt would eventually go down to the aquifer. So we saw we were able to find high cl uh, chlorides there. We worked with that town and they were able to put up a structure to cover their sand and salt. So it helps us in that way too. And before I let you go, um, especially during the summer, we wanna make sure we're teaching everybody about water conservation, especially during the summer, especially on the East End. So our supply of water is sufficient. There's a lot of water in the aquifers, but it's not limitless. And that's important to keep in mind. Um, higher water usage also means more infrastructure for the water authority. So the more demand that our system, uh, the more demand that's put in our system, uh, the more wells will inevitably have to drill wells and that kind of infrastructure is of course expensive. What we tell people um, is that higher peak usage, three to 7 a.m. actually has the most impact on our system. People don't think of three o'clock in the morning as peak water usage time because nobody's awake, um, but it's the time where everyone's sprinkler systems kick on at once. Um, almost 70% um, of all of the water that we pump out at Suffolk County Water Authority goes on people's lawns during the summer. Kevin and his staff do such a tremendous job making sure that the water is safe only for it to end up on the grass uh, more often than not. So to cut back on irrigation is really the best advice I can give you for um, conserving water and saving money on your water bill as well for one of our customers. Um, we know it sounds counterintuitive, but that we sell water and we're asking you to use less water. Um, but believe me, it's a, it's a better solution for everybody. Obviously, over pumping uh, can also have negative water quality impacts, especially in coastal communities. So this is a chart of seasonal water usage uh, data that we've collected. So you can see the, uh, the x-axis here is the time of day with zero being midnight. And the y-axis is gallons per minute um, by 100,000 milestones. So you've got the solid blue line here. That's how much we're pumping in the winter. The orange and red lines are summer, weekday, and weekend. But our, what I really want to show you is this light blue line here. Uh, we pump all that water so that people can water their lawns in the rain. It's, it's, a, it's a huge problem for us in the, in the summer, and it's really just 100% wasted water when you think about it. Um, that light blue line should really mirror that dark blue winter line in theory, um, and it doesn't even come close. So how do we change that? Um, well, one of the best things you can do if you have an irrigation timer is water any other time but 3 to 7 a.m. That takes a lot of pressure off of our infrastructure. Um, it can improve your morning shower even if all of your neighbors aren't watering at the same time. It's critical for fire protection. If there's a fire at you know, 5 a.m., we want to make sure we have the pressure we need to fight that fire. Use an odd even watering schedule. So if your house has an odd address, only water on odd days of the calendar and vice versa. Uh, your, your lawn actually doesn't need to be watered every day. Other, every other day is perfectly sufficient in terms of uh, lawn watering. And one of the easiest things you can do is consider using a smart irrigation timer. Um, it's smart just means it's uh, able to connect to Wi-Fi. So it connects to the Wi-Fi in your home. It's measuring hyper-local weather patterns. So the timer will know if it's gonna rain on Tuesday, I won't water on Monday, that kind of thing. Uh, if you do invest in one of these smart irrigation timers, you're eligible for a uh, credit of up to $50 off your SCWA bill. So that's just something we use to incentivize um, people to use water saving devices. Like smart controllers, there are also other eligible devices that I'll, co I'll cover later to get that $50 credit. So the average user versus the water waster, um, our average residential customer uses just about 130,000 gallons a year annually. We did have one customer um, in East Hampton. They used approximately 22 million gallons a couple of years ago. This is primarily due to um, uh, irrigating a large state, but also a geothermal heating and cooling system. Um, the Water Authority is not against geothermal systems. Um, they can be a very green way to cool and heat your home. Uh, the only thing that, that we would ask is that um, if you're going to use geothermal, that you go with a, a closed loop system. The open loop system takes public water and puts and just moves it through and is really wasting that water, whereas a closed loop system will use the same water all the time. So it's not as, as wasteful. Um, just for comparison, uh, uh, Southampton Hospital 
used 14 and a half million gallons that year and the one home used 22 million so more than a hospital that's that's the kind of thing we're trying to avoid our top 10 water conservation tips like i said the, the smartest and most helpful thing you can do is use those smart irrigation controllers or consider a rain sensor for your irrigation system uh, those are also both eligible for the $50 uh, bill credit watering less often such as i even um, looking for that logo in the middle, the EPA WaterSense logo on products. Um, taking shorter showers, obviously, and detecting and fixing leaks is a big one. Even you know one drip per minute leak, um, you might think it, it's nothing, but it really adds up over the course of a year. I think most people do this already, but obviously, you know, not having the water while you're brushing your teeth adds up if you're doing it, you know, every day or twice a day. Making sure that we're using uh, full loads when we go to the washing machine, to the dishwasher. Using mulch, which can help uh, keep plants moist as opposed to overwatering plants. Um, you know, maybe using a broom on the driveway as opposed to the hose. And car washes actually, uh, most of them, I should say, do recycle the water that they're using. So it's more water efficient um, than actually washing your car in the driveway. Like I said, the Water Authority offers a uh, $50 credit. Um, to anybody who purchases a water saving device. So those devices include smart irrigation systems, rain sensors, faucet aerators, um, and we've included uh, low flow shower heads, and we've now included uh, what we, they call, um, uh, they actually go in, they go in your water service line. It's like a smart water service line device that actually when you're not home, you could turn off uh, your service line. So there's definitely no water coming to your home, even if there's a leak, the water be shut off. If you're going away on vacation, those are great. And if you want to learn more about the WaterWise program, uh, we've got a dedicated email that has questions about it, waterwisecheckup at scwa.com. Uh, we've got a dedicated phone number for that. Uh, you could always message us on, on Facebook and Twitter and we'll see it. Um, and then we also have the WaterWise Checkup program, which is another free service we offer. Uh, one of our water experts will actually sit down with you one-on-one, -on -one, will estimate your water usage at every given point in your home, and we'll give you a personalized plan to cut back. And then last but not least, the Our Water, Our Lives campaign. This is another initiative of LICAP. Um, it's, this has become the water conservation brand for Nassau and Suffolk County. We're trying to grow it. We're trying to get the message out. Um, you may have seen some of our ads before on uh, Sports Illustrated or, or, or Newsday.com. Um, basically, we're trying to get Long Islanders to do their part and pledge to conserve water at OurWaterOurLives.com. You may have seen this at some of the local beaches handing out our water, our lives, beach towels, things like that. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. We'll obviously do um, the audience here in person first if anyone has any more questions. <laughs>